We often use the word decisive battle to denote the engagement that brought the end of a conflict or quickened it, but some battles transcend that as they change the fates of entire empires or civilizations. In 48 BC, the great Roman civil war was approaching its high point, with Caesar and Pompey maneuvering around Greece. The Battle of Pharsalus would pit the old friends against each other yet again, with the whole Roman world in balance. Shout out to Magellan TV for sponsoring this video and being our most loyal partner. We've been enjoying our Magellan TV subscription and hope that our viewers love it too. Magellan TV is a documentary streaming service run by filmmakers that has over 3,000 documentaries, among them hundreds of historical documentaries. We're excited to announce that Magellan is now offering a buy one, get one free gift card for the people in your life you want to give the gift of knowledge. Go to our link in the description, press our banner, and take advantage of this limited offer for our viewers. Purchasing a gift card at any time of the year will also give you an additional month of Magellan TV for free, even if you're a member. Now is the time to try it and share it with your friends and family. We recommend The Hidden History of Rome and Meet the Romans, as both of these titles provide so much fun knowledge of Roman history. You can watch both anytime, anywhere on your television, laptop or mobile device, and it's compatible with most devices. The best part is Magellan TV is offering a one-month free membership trial to our viewers. If you haven't signed up to Magellan yet, support our channel and do that at try.magellantv.com slash kingsandgenerals. You'll get a free one-month membership trial. Following the defeat at Dyrrhachium, Caesar was in a precarious position. The army under his command was by now heavily depleted, and his other legions were scattered around Greece, two under Domitius Calvinus around Macedonia, and one in southern Greece under Longinus and Sabinus. Caesar's defeat also meant that his supporters would be wavering. He needed a victory soon, and it would need to be decisive. Caesar's priority was to get his army back into fighting condition, so he first marched to Apollonia, where he left his wounded, and sent seven cohorts to garrison various towns and cities under his control. Longinus's legion would be safe in southern Greece, but Domitius and his two veteran legions of Gallic campaigns, who had been stalling and pinning Scipio Metellus during Dyrrhachium, were now exposed. All of Caesar's plans now revolved around merging his depleted army with Domitius. If Pompey marched on Italy, Caesar would meet up with Domitius and march through Illyria to attack Pompey from the rear. If Pompey marched on Caesar, Caesar would march to Domitius and fight a battle with the merged army. If Pompey besieged Caesar's allied towns in Greece, Caesar would march to Domitius and attack Scipio forcing Pompey to react or lose an ally. Before any of these plans could be put into effect though, Caesar had to get to Domitius. He began his march at full pace from Apollonia. Pompey, however, had also come to a similar conclusion. If Scipio was caught unsupported, his legions would surely be lost. Both Caesar and Pompey were once again in a race with each other, each hoping to reach their ally before the other. Leaving Cato in control of Dyrrhachium, Pompey began his march to Scipio. As he did, he took measures to slow Caesar, spreading the word of his defeat at Dyrrhachium, and as a result, Caesar found little support on his march, and his scouts and messengers found it impossible to reach Domitius. When both armies were just four hours from the positions of Domitius and Scipio, Caesar had a stroke of luck. Some of the Gauls who had defected to Pompey and Dyrrhachium had yet another change of heart, racing to Domitius and warning him of Pompey's approach and Caesar's location. Armed with this knowledge, Domitius was able to safely reposition and merge with Caesar. Caesar's whole army in the region, aside from the 27th, was now united. Nonetheless, Pompey still held the upper hand. He had more local support and supplies, and so his intention was now to avoid another confrontation with Caesar. Despite his numbers, he was still aware of both how much more experienced the enemy forces were compared to many of his own, and how dangerous Caesar was in the field. 
in Plutarch's words, Caesar and that army, who had stormed a thousand cities, subdued over three thousand nations, gained numberless battles of the Germans and Gauls, taken a million prisoners, and killed as many in the field. Pompey was confident that, in time, Caesar would run out of supplies and that his army would break down. This was known as the Fabian strategy, and had been used to great effect by Fabius Maximus against Hannibal in the Second Punic War. Many high-ranking members of Pompey's army, however, were pushing for a decisive battle. Ahenobarbus, Scipio, Afranius and Cicero applied pressure to Pompey, accusing the general variously of cowardice and even of having been bribed. Pompey would have to act soon, or risk his army fracturing. Caesar, on the other hand, had wasted no time. He marched quickly to Gomphi, an important town with many supplies, and home to the Praetor of Thessaly, Androsthenes. Androsthenes had previously promised his and Thessaly's support for Caesar, but following Dyrrhachium, had defected to Pompey, closing the gates of the city to Caesar. Caesar did not have the supplies or time to conduct a prolonged siege, so he decided to storm the town. The attack started at three in the afternoon and was all over by sunset, a number of nobles, likely including Androsthenes, committing suicide. Despite their defeat at Dyrrhachium, Caesar's veterans were still a force to be reckoned with. After resupplying, Caesar marched to Metropolis, which surrendered upon hearing the fate of Gomphi. Many other towns soon followed suit, and Caesar soon had enough local support to resupply his army for the time being. Pompey knew that if he could keep Caesar pinned in Thessaly, he would still eventually run out of supplies and be starved out. But the pressure from his officers was continually mounting. Finally, Pompey relented to their demands and marched his army to Pharsalus to give battle, setting up his camp on the high ground. Morale amongst Pompey's men was high, and his officers were confident of victory. They had a huge numerical advantage and had already defeated Caesar once. Already talks were being had about who would be the consuls and praetors after the war, and who would get the property of Caesar and his allies, and who would hold Caesar's position of Pontifex Maximus after his defeat. According to Caesar, they were not concerned with the means by which they could gain the upper hand, but with the way in which they ought to use their victory. Their confidence was not unfounded. Pompey's army numbered around 47,000 infantry and 7,000 cavalry. Caesar's army, on the other hand, now numbered only around 21,000 infantry and 500 cavalry, according to his own account. Due to Caesar not counting his auxiliaries in this account, it is possible that the number of infantry and cavalry Caesar gives is underplayed, and Appian suggests his infantry numbered nearer 30,000 and cavalry around 2,000. Caesar was equally confident, though. His army was not as numerous, but it was more experienced and disciplined. Only a handful of Pompey's legions were true veterans, many having been recruited specifically for the war and only having seen their first action at Dyrrhachium. While the bulk of Pompey's infantry were Roman legions, they were supported by auxiliaries and allies from the east, making up the majority of light infantry and cavalry. These men, though all skilled warriors, would not have been trained to fight in the Roman style, and the multitude of languages spoken in Pompey's army would have made coordination difficult. The men Caesar had under his command were from his ten veteran legions, all of whom had fought with him since his Gallic campaigns, some for as many as twelve years. Every day, Caesar would march his army out of the camp to the base of Pompey's hill, offering battle. Pompey each time refused to commit, pulling his men out of camp but never moving from the high ground. It was clear that he was still not wholly committed to a pitched battle and did not want to give up his advantageous position, only being willing to commit to minor skirmishes. While these maneuvers were going on, Caesar also mounted some of his infantry, 
drilling them each day to bring his cavalry up to 2,000, still much less than Pompey's, but enough to at least stall them. It had been almost a month now since the Battle of Dyrrhachium, and Caesar eventually decided that if Pompey would not give battle, his best strategy would be to keep his army on the march, moving camp every day, forcing Pompey to shadow him and wearing out Pompey's less disciplined force. On the 9th of August 48 BC, Caesar was about to put this plan into action and had his army prepared to decamp, when Pompey's army suddenly moved off from their position on the hill to the plains to give battle. It is not entirely clear why Pompey chose to do this. The most likely answer is that he was pressured by his supporters who, upon seeing Caesar ready to move, were worried Caesar would slip away and had pressed Pompey to seize the opportunity and give battle. Whatever the reason, Caesar took it as a blessing and also prepared his army for a battle on now even terrain. Pompey knew that his key advantages were his cavalry and his numbers, and he drew up his army to best maximize their effectiveness. His infantry was formed into the classic Roman triplex equis, but slightly deeper than the usual 10 men depth order to better hold a defensive line. On his left wing, he stationed two legions under the command of Lucius Lentulus. These were two of Pompey's most experienced legions, one raised by himself, and the other having been raised by Caesar for the Gallic Wars, and later handed to Pompey just before the Civil War. In his centre, he stationed Scipio and his Syrian legions, while the right would be held by two legions combined into one, with a river to their right protecting their flank. Within this twin legion were veterans from Cilicia and from Spain, likely survivors from the Battle of Ilerda. They were commanded by Ahenobarbus, one of Caesar's most active opponents. All these legions were Pompey's best men. They would take the brunt of the attack, while Pompey's less experienced legions, allies and auxiliaries would form the two back lines. On Pompey's extreme left were his 7,000 cavalry, under the command of Labienus, supported by Pompey's skirmishers and archers. A further 2,000 infantry were held in reserve in Pompey's camp, under the command of Afranius and Pompey's son Gnaeus. Pompey positioned himself on the left. His plan was to use the tactic of his hero, Alexander the Great. With Ohenobarbus and the river guarding his right flank, Pompey's infantry would hold the line while the entire cavalry force would flank left, destroying Caesar's cavalry before falling on his legions from behind becoming the hammer to the anvil of the defending legions. Caesar also drew his army up in the Triplex Aquis formation. The 10th Legion, Caesar's personal favorite and some of his best troops, were stationed on his right opposite Pompey. These men were commanded by Sulla, who had distinguished himself at Dyrrhachium, and this was also where Caesar positioned himself. On the left, Caesar positioned two of his other most experienced legions, the 8th and 9th, with the river to their left. These two legions had suffered so many casualties over recent campaigns that they were ordered to work as one legion under the command of Antony. The centre would be held by the 11th and 12th under the command of Domitius. Caesar's remaining legions filled the 2nd and 3rd lines, the third having strict orders to not engage until Caesar gave the signal. In order to match Pompey's line, Caesar had to stretch his own thin, only six men deep. Caesar's cavalry was stationed opposite Pompey's. They were hopelessly outnumbered, and Caesar was well aware that they would not be able to stall Pompey's horse for long. As such, he also pulled 3,000 men from various legions arming them with spears and forming them into a fourth line behind. Caesar was the one to begin the engagement, ordering his front two lines to charge Pompey's. Caesar's men expected Pompey's infantry to countercharge, as was standard military custom, but they instead stood fast holding their line. In a brilliant display of discipline, Caesar's men spontaneously halted mid-charge and reassembled. After a brief pause to regain their stamina, 
They moved slowly forward, only breaking into a charge once again when nearer to Pompey's line. Javelins were hurled from both sides, and Pompey's men, braced and with interlocked shields, held the line. An intense melee ensued with brutal close quarters fighting. Pompey now put his plan into action. Labienus led the Pompeian cavalry to Caesar's right flank, supported by the skirmishers and archers, smashing into the Caesarian cavalry. Caesar's men could not hold off the onslaught for long, gradually being forced back before retreating entirely. They had, however, performed their role. Whilst Pompey's cavalry had been fighting with Caesar's, Caesar had given the order for his fourth line of spear-armed infantry to wheel around and face Labienus and his cavalry. The Pompeian cavalry had been preparing to charge Caesar's legions in the rear, but with Caesar's cavalry acting as a screen, they hadn't seen Caesar's fourth line move into position, and now they found themselves being attacked by 3,000 heavily armoured spearmen. Pompey's cavalry, though numerous, were not heavy cavalry, and many were young nobles with little experience of warfare. Fighting veteran spearmen head-on was not something they were cut out for. They were routed quickly, being forced to retreat to the distant high ground to try and regroup, but the damage had already been done. Caesar's fourth line pushed on into Pompey's missile troops, easily crushing them. As they pushed on, it was now Pompey who was being flanked. His left-flanked legions, both who had previously fought alongside Caesar and his legions, now found themselves attacked on multiple fronts by their old comrades, the 10th legion from the front and the 4th line from the left flank and rear. It was at this point that Caesar committed his third line of fresh troops, throwing every man he had into the battle. Under this huge pressure, Pompey's line began to break, starting with the 1st and 3rd. This was also where Pompey had stationed himself, and, almost becoming surrounded, he had little choice but to flee the battlefield and retreat to his camp. The rest of Pompey's line broke in quick succession, Caesar's fourth line rolling up the flank, while his fresh third line pushed from the front. Some attempted to follow their general and retreat to their camp, others simply fled the battlefield. Caesar, knowing his victory needed to be complete, stormed the camp easily overwhelming the few thousand reserves and men who had retreated. Those that had retreated from the battlefield were soon surrounded on a hill and forced to surrender. Caesar had won. By the time Caesar stormed the camp, however, Pompey had already gone, fleeing with 30 bodyguards. Many other high-ranking Pompeians, such as Labienus, Afranius, Scipio and Pompey's son Gnaeus, had also managed to escape. Nonetheless, not all had been so lucky. Ahenobarbus, brave but ill-starred, had been cut down in the retreat, possibly by Antony himself. Many others had been captured in Pompey's camp and in the immediate aftermath. Among these was a young man, Marcus Junius Brutus. The son of Caesar's mistress, Brutus was held in high regard by Caesar who had given his men orders to not kill Brutus. When Brutus surrendered, Caesar was overjoyed, welcoming him with open arms. Caesar showed his customary leniency to Pompey's soldiers as well, with more than 24,000 surrendering to him. In total, Caesar claimed to have lost 200 men and 30 centurions in the battle, while giving the Pompeian losses as 15,000 dead and the 24,000 surrendered. These numbers seem suspiciously exaggerated, and Appian suggests it was more likely 1,200 of Caesar's men dead and 6,000 of Pompey's, the rest surrendering or fleeing. Whichever is closer to the truth, the fact remains that Caesar's victory was decisive. Aside from having broken Pompey's largest army, he had scattered the Pompeian officers, many fleeing to North Africa, and absorbed many of Pompey's surrendered men into his army, almost doubling its size. Pompey himself sailed first to the Greek islands of Lesbos and Mytilene, meeting his wife Cornelia and his youngest son Sextus. 
his intent was to get his family far away from Caesar, and use his connections in the east to rebuild an army to resist Caesar. By the time he reached Cyprus, he had taken out private loans and put together a fleet along with 2,000 men. His defeat, however, had cost him much public support. Pompey had initially planned to head to the province of Syria, but they turned against him and he was forced to look elsewhere. He decided on Egypt. The boy pharaoh Ptolemy XIII owed his throne to Pompey. Pompey having supported Ptolemy's father and guaranteeing his will that made Ptolemy pharaoh. Pompey had also lent a number of officers and soldiers from his eastern command to the pharaoh's army. Confident he would find support there, Pompey sailed to Egypt. He was met off the coast by a small rowing boat which would take Pompey to shore. Aboard were a man called Savius, the head of the Egyptian army Achilles, and an ex-officer of Pompey's, Lucius Septimius. Pompey's wife was worried about this lack of pomp and suspected something was not right, but Pompey was reassured by the presence of Septimius. Stepping off his ship, he quoted a line of Sophocles to his wife, He who enters a tyrant's door becomes his slave, even if he leaves a free man. As the small boat rowed to shore, Pompey tried to alleviate the tense atmosphere, telling Septimius he was an old comrade. He received only a nod of recognition in response. Septimius then struck, stabbing the old general, quickly followed by both Achilles and Savius. Septimius then beheaded his corpse, throwing the body naked into the sea. Ptolemy, upon the counsel of his advisers, had betrayed Pompey in order to try and win approval from Caesar. Pompey the Great, three times consul, conqueror of the East, and one of the Roman Republic's most prolific generals, was dead. It is worth noting how revered Pompey was. Plutarch despaired that he and Caesar had gone to war. Had they been willing to enjoy the fruits of their labours in peace and tranquility, the greatest and best part of the world was their own. If they must have victories and triumphs, what Scythian horse, what Parthian arrows, what Indian treasures could have resisted 70,000 Romans, led on by Pompey and Caesar? Though arguably past his prime at Pharsalus, Pompey had not at all fought badly. His plan was solid and the best that could be done. The reason for his defeat was not poor generalship, but the skill and experience of Caesar and his infantry, and the lack of experience of Pompey's cavalry. Pompey and Caesar were both incredibly talented generals, and it is telling how often the two decided on similar strategies. When Caesar reached Egypt having pursued Pompey, he was first presented with Pompey's head. Disgusted, he turned away. He was next presented the seal of Pompey, at which point Caesar broke down in tears. Though enemies in later life, it is worth remembering that Caesar and Pompey had been political allies for around eight years, had effectively ruled Rome together, and had even been related by marriage. Caesar was well aware that, despite being his enemy, Pompey had been a titan of his time, worthy of his respect. Caesar's victory marked a turning point in the war. It was now the Optimates who would find themselves on the back foot. Nevertheless, the war was far from over. Pompey's staunchest supporters, Cato, Scipio, and Pompey's sons, Gnaeus and Sextus, had all fled to North Africa to continue the resistance. With them also was Labienus, now undoubtedly the best commander among the Optimates. Our series on Caesar's civil war will continue, so make sure you are subscribed and have pressed the bell button. Please consider liking, commenting and sharing, it helps immensely. Our videos would be impossible without our kind patrons and YouTube channel members, whose ranks you can join via the links in the description to know our schedule, get early access to our videos, access our Discord and much more. This is the Kings and Generals channel, and we will catch you on the next one.